Uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this week on our weekly research morning call. Unfortunately, uh, we will not be having any technicals today uh, because Zen is on leave. But for our stock counters update, uh, we have our tech international initiation. And for our macro, we have our semiconductors update, banking money, and as well as our SG weekly. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over the time uh, to John to talk about semicons. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, and morning, everyone. Hey, so I'll just begin with a quick quarterly update on the semiconductor industry. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so overall, we'll just go through the, the four main, I guess, subsectors, uh, processor, memory, equipment, and foundry. Now on the processor side, that would be your CPUs and your GPUs. Um, they're seeing a bit more, sounding a bit more upbeat on PC demand, which has been weak for the last uh, almost two years. Um, Intel and AMD both beat uh, on, on their revenue and earnings expectations. Um, and they're also seeing uh, increasing PC demand due to a few reasons. Uh, firstly, uh, channel inventory has improved. Um, uh, and, and secondly, there's a little bit, uh, just kind of in the early stages of a commercial PC upcycling as, as a lot of enterprises um, uh, are looking to upgrade their PCs from older models. Um, as well as this uh, ongoing interest or, or growing interest in uh, AI PCs, which are essentially higher spec uh, uh, PCs that can uh, do a lot of your accelerated compute um, and handle more uh, complex uh, uh, processing. Uh, in terms of the, the GPU demand, um, the demand for AI GPUs is still far outstripping supply. Uh, you can see that from uh, increased expectations from AMD for their MI300X uh, sales for this year, uh, which are, is their AI GPU. So they, they increased it from uh, more than 3.5 billion to 4 billion US dollars uh, for the full year, uh, 2024. Um, at the same time, uh, needless to say, NVIDIA is also seeing a significant uh, uh, acceleration or rather sequential growth. Uh, and they're ramping at about 4 billion US dollar uh, uh, ramp per quarter in their supply. Uh, and so for, for NVIDIA, and both NVIDIA and AMD, and because they have so much demand, um, their customers are actually pushing them to, to uh, acquire more supply. Um, and just, this, just based on a numbers perspective, is just going to be driving their revenue, uh, both sequentially as well as uh, year, year and year. Um, the good news for a lot of the, I guess, hype around AI GPUs is that uh, these these uh, companies are starting to see a broadening in customer base, uh, which should help to support you know the high growth expectations. Uh, so it's not just a single group of customers that are demanding for these AI GPUs. It's actually spreading. Um, you know, it's no longer just your hyperscalers and some of your your big tech companies, but it's actually spreading to a lot of other enterprises as well as a lot of other sovereign nations as uh, interest in AI grows and, and builds out their own uh, uh, proprietary AI models. Uh, because uh, GPUs are essentially the, the, the core uh, essential uh, infrastructure that is needed for these uh, kind of uh, processors. Um, in terms of memory, uh, which is, I, I guess, memory is the, the segment that, that is highlighted in this uh, red box on the left. Um, they, they're the key segment for this uh, past quarter because um, you, know, you can see their revenue growth, you know, 57%, 63%, 136%. So significant growth across the whole uh, I guess, subsector, um, mainly due to a few reasons. Uh, 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 there, there was an increase in pricing, uh, mainly due to more demand for high bandwidth memory. Uh, high bandwidth is just, you know, instead of your, I guess, 4 or 8 gig RAM for your, uh, that's what's in your PCs right now, you know, high bandwidth is like 128 uh, gigabyte of RAM uh, uh, th that uh, are, is required on uh, uh, these AI GPU platforms. So for, for example, uh, NVIDIA's new uh, Blackwell GPU platform uh, has about 33% more uh, high bandwidth uh, memory components on it uh, compared to its older Hopper versions. Uh, so as you know, as more and more of these Blackwell uh, platforms are, are demanded and being made, uh, naturally you see a high demand for uh, HBM, which is high bandwidth memory. Uh, secondly, inventory levels are also improving. Uh, so that's good for you know supply demand dynamics. Um, these uh, memory companies are, are able to charge a little bit more because they, they don't need to uh, cut prices to clear inventory. Uh, now it's the opposite. You know, there's, there's increasing demand and they can actually raise prices. Um, and their customers will still uh, be able to pay and, and demand a significant amount from them. Uh, so we expect you know, prices to further increase, uh, at least 
towards the end of, of this year and into next year as uh, AI demand continues to grow, uh, as well as there's sort of this end of uh, Windows 10 support. Um, so this kind of ties into the uh, commercial PC upcycling because you know, as as new newer and newer, uh, 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 I guess OS uh, is is uh, issued or is put into the market, and there's as you know there's a need for higher and higher computing. Uh, naturally, you need a little bit uh, better um, memory performance on your PCs. Uh, so that's driving the demand for for uh, memory. Uh, the big thing for these memory companies is that all, all three companies actually went back to profitability um, after about you know, four to five quarters of just losses. Uh, so essentially, they just lost money the whole of 2023 and a little bit of 2022. Um, and so this is a good sign. The, the biggest reason for this, obviously, is because their top line is growing. Uh, so they kind of just, because they have a high fixed cost base, it just kind of flows through. Uh, so they, they, you know, as quantity grows, there's a bit of offering leverage there that kicks in. Um, in terms of uh, forward guidance, only Micron uh, gave guidance for this upcoming quarter. And so they guided to a, a continued acceleration in growth. You see there about 76% year on year, uh, which is a very positive sign for the memory industry in general. Um, the commentary from both Samsung and Hynix were also very positive. Uh, they continue to to build out new factories to to grow uh, production uh, capabilities because they're seeing uh, you know such a, a, a surge in demand for memories. Um, next slide, please. So for equipment companies, um, Sean, next slide. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so for equipment companies, um, there's a little bit of hit and miss here. All three companies, you know, they beat expectations or, or were in line, but expectations weren't really that high for them to begin with. Uh, the, the plus side is that uh, they are seeing improving inventory as well as utilization levels, which is a good sign of, a, I guess, of a, a, a base or a recovery in, in uh, the equipment market. Uh, they are also see, seeing you know stronger domestic investments in China, um, which is, I guess, a bit counterintuitive because of the you know, ongoing uh, uh, trade tensions or trade wars with China and, and chip bans. Um, so essentially, China is looking to. Everybody knows they're looking to, to because of these bans, they're looking to uh, build their their own capabilities, and that's where we see a little bit of a, a stronger investment there. Uh, in terms of their forward guidance, you know, all, all three companies got it to, to I guess, better or, or improve uh, revenue growth or, or slightly less revenue contraction. Uh, and it's positive. It just kind of indicates that, that at least uh, as we head into the second half of this year, there's, there's a little bit more uh, optimism in, in the equipment market. And, and um, I guess the equipment essentially is the last, the last piece of the puzzle for, for overall recovery in the semiconductor industry. Uh, when we move to Foundry, I think the biggest one is TSMC. Uh, good news for TSMC, you know, revenue continues to grow at a healthy rate. Um, guidance is also, uh, you know, very good actually. Uh, but for TSMC, the, the main thing is that they're, they're starting to build up uh, about seven new fabrication plants uh, across the world to support uh, the increasing demand, especially for their 3NM and, and 2NM uh, chips, which are uh, essentially your, your very high spec uh, uh uh, chips used in you know all, all of your AI GPUs and, and so on, uh, AI components. Uh, so three of these pairs will be in Arizona. Uh, one is already in, in uh, construction and is expected to be begin volume production in the first half of next year. Uh, while two are in Japan and two are in Germany. Um, the only a little bit of downside coming out from TSMC or, or negative commentary is that they actually reduced the the expectations for the overall for overall semicon uh, market growth for this year. So they dropped it from 20%, uh, which is what they expected uh, at the end of last year, um, to about 10%. So they cut it in half. Uh, they're still, they're, one of the re reasons for this is they still see uh, kind of a sluggish recovery in traditional server demand, um, while they also shifted their expectations on automotive platforms, um, which they, they expected to grow this year, but now they expect to contract. Uh, so those two were the main kind of, I guess, uh, uh, components that were dragging down the expectations. Uh, on the flip side, you know, they still guided to their own uh, company growth of 20 to 25% for this year, which essentially means that um, they're going to be outperforming the overall semicon market by at least double. Um, so so they still expect to do fairly well, which is a good sign for, for the overall, I guess, uh, foundry market or TSMC since they are the biggest players. Uh, yeah, so, so overall for semiconductors, you know, we're kind of moving upwards in, in terms of uh, where we are in the recovery cycle. 
but only real laggards right now are still your equipment manufacturers um, because utilization rates are, are relatively low, but they've always maintained this commentary about uh, improving throughout the year and, and 2025 being uh, sort of the better year for them. So we'll have to, I guess, wait and see. Um, yeah, so with that, you know, I'll hand it over to Glenn for the Banking Month. Thank you. Hey, thanks, John. Yeah, so for the Banking Monthly, uh, we'll go to the first slide and they'll be talking about the both Singapore interest rates as well as Hong Kong interest rates. So for the Singapore interest rates, the three-month SORA was uh, inched up. It was up two basis points by to 3.68% in May. And this is uh, it has actually risen for two consecutive months in 2024. So it was also up by six basis points year on year, and it's also two basis points higher than the first quarter's average of 3.66%. But notably, this is the second smallest year on year increase since March of 2022. So we are, we are seeing the Singapore interest rates at least uh, hovering around this three high 3.6 percentage uh, percent, you know, around there for the last uh, for the for this year at least. For the Hong Kong interest rates, the three month high ball recovered slightly and it was up 13 basis points to 4.67 percent, and this was slightly reversing the decline of 16 basis points in April. So it also improved by 26 basis points year on year, but was still six basis points lower than the first quarter's average of 4.73%. Now moving on to the next slide, we'll be looking at the loans growth. So the Singapore loans growth rose by 1.5% year on year to 804 billion. And this is notably the largest year on year increase since October of 2022. And I think we have seen it uh, increase for the last two months already for the loans growth. So we still do expect low single digits growth for 2024 and for this to continue as the loans growth is expected to continue being positive going into the second half of the year. For the business loans, it rose by 1.8% year on year with the loans to the building and construction segment, the single largest business segment growing by 0.1%, while the loans to the manufacturing segment falling by 12% year on year. The consumer loans also grew by 1%. And this is the fourth consecutive year-on-year -year increase recorded since December 2022. For the housing loans, which comprise around 70% of consumer lending, it grew by 1.3% year-on-year. For the total deposits and balances, which includes the deposits uh, in all currencies made by non-bank customers, it grew by 5% year-on-year to 1,851 billion. And the current account or savings account proportion was maintained at 18.3%. So we are seeing actually the deposits and as well as both the CASA also increasing slightly, which means that uh, more people are putting money. Actually, some people are putting money into their uh, fixed deposits as well as the current accounts. Now for the Hong Kong loans, it was a different story. It, started, it continued to decline and it actually fell by 5.7% year on year as well as 1% month on month in April. And uh, this was larger than the decline. This decline was larger than the previous month's one. So notably, the loans growth has been on a continuous decline, year-on-year -year decline since June of 2022. Now moving on to the next slide, we'll be looking at the SGX uh, statistics. So the preliminary SDAV or Securities Daily Average Volume rose by 22% year-on-year in May, while the DDAV or Derivatives Daily Average Volume grew 23% year-on-year and 20% month-on-month in April. While the VIX, which is the market index that measures the implied volatility of the S&P 500, so we use this to see the volatility, averaged around 13.1 in May, and this is down from 16.1 in the previous month. So volatility has dipped slightly. For the top four equity index futures turnover, it rose by 2% year-on-year in May to 11 million contracts, mainly due to the higher trading volumes of the MSCI Singapore index futures, as well as the FTSE Taiwan index futures. So notably, the FTSE China A50 actually rose 5% month-on-month, while the Nikkei 225 index was futures was down 26% month-on-month in May. Now moving on to the next slide, we're looking at the, the Singapore bank's performance. So for May, all three local banks' share price performance continued to uh, perform well, and it was up in May. Sorry. DBFs uh, continued to perform the best, with the largest increase of 3%, while OCBC and UOB uh, improved by 2% and 1% respectively. So DBS continued to be the best performer this month, likely due to the FY24 guide, dividend guidance being the highest amongst the three local banks, as well as them providing clear guidance for dividend growth in the coming years. 
while both OCBC and UOB are actually maintaining their guidance, their guidance of a dividend payout ratio of 50%. And they also haven't given much uh, information or clarity on how excess capital will be returned to their shareholders. Now moving on to the next slide. Yeah, the next slide will be showing, um, I just put in, a, this is a sort of a topical uh, topic of the month. So this for this month, it will be uh, how the, how we feel the AUM as well as uh, fee income will be the growth drivers for for the three local banks for this year. So with the interest rates stagnating as well as expectations for rate cuts in the later part of the year, the three local banks would be looking at their fee income to sustain their earnings momentum. For some context, fee income in the first quarter grew by 16% year-on-year, mainly, mainly from an increase in the wealth management fees. And this increase in wealth management fees was due to a shift in the investor sentiment due to the expectation of rate cuts where the demand and funds will move from deposits into investment products. Hence, the wealth management fee income actually grew. The AUM also grew by around 13% year-on-year to reach a new high, and mainly from continued net new money inflows. So in comparison, if you look at the two international peers like HSBC and Standard Chartered, they both showed smaller growth in their fee income of only increasing by 9% year on year, as well as AUM growth of only 13% year on year. So with this, we do continue to expect the local bank's fee income to grow by double digits and have also forecasted year on year growth of around 14% for FI24, which could add around 340 million to their revenue. So the growth will be led by a continued move from deposits into higher risk investments as interest rates remain flat, with an expectation of rate cuts into the later part of the year. There's also a possibility for the bank's spread from their AUM to grow as market sentiment improve. And as the bank's net interest income as well as net interest margins remain stable, we believe that fee income will provide the driver for earnings growth going into FY24. Now moving on to the last slide, we do maintain yeah, we do maintain overweight and on the banking sector. We remain positive on the banks. The net interest margins will likely, likely remain flat in FY24, despite the higher for longer interest rate environment. But both loan growth as well as fee income recovery will uplift their profits. The bank dividend yields are also attractive with upside surprises due to excess capital ratios, as well as a push towards higher ROEs. So that's all I have for the banking sector. I'll now hand it over to Paul. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Glenn. Um, I'll move on to our initiation. So, all tech was initially a non rated, but we moved it to a rated uh, rating. Uh, so, the, as the title suggests, we think the company is riding on uh, several major KPEX cycles by their customers. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, so, we, uh, we initiated with a target price of 70 cents. Uh, it's a, uh, so, so the background so, this company has been around for, I think, more than 40 years. It got listed only two, two years ago. Oh, uh, they what they do is they design and build palm oil refineries. So most of their customers are all palm plantations. They also do fractionalization, basically just a or specialty fats. So just a fancy term of you not know, apart from just refining the palm oil into uh to refine CPO. So they also do more downstream value added could be cocoa butter. Some of it used for for uh cosmetics. Some of it used for even for polynutrients. Yeah. Uh, the, then they also build for biodiesel. The the important one will be uh the huge one will be if they can do a hydrogenated vegetable or HPO, which will be the feedstock for SAF. I will discuss a bit later. So for over the last four years, what we've seen is that their order book has been growing uh, historically at least uh, fifty percent per annum over the last four years. Uh, last week their order book jumped another thirty percent. To about 400 million to another record. Uh, they, they normally don't announce every, every contract, but they tend to aggregate, then, then they'll announce. So there was a 30% jump. So, in terms of some of the growth drivers, so this is, is a, they are dependent on customer capex because they are building factories. So that's why it's important for us to kind of ascertain where the growth is. So they're riding on a few cycles. So, firstly, is of course biodiesel blending in Malaysia. So, in Malaysia, uh, they have bio, uh, they have diesel, but there's a B10, what it means that 10% of the diesel comes from palm oil. Uh, the plan is to move it to uh, B20. It, it has been stuck at B10 for a while, but uh, we expect it to, to increase, to double the capacity to uh, soon. And also, especially uh, just today, they announced that they will be uh, removing or reducing the 
the subsidy on the petroleum diesel diesel. So this makes it more important for them, uh, makes it more competitive or profitable if they can add in palm oil. And of course, uh, Indonesia is also moving from B35. They just implemented it uh, last year to B40. So the jump for Indonesia, it won't be so huge. But what is happening is Indonesia is the point number two. Uh, there'll be no, more biodiesel facilities nationwide because most of the biodiesel plants now are like in Java and so forth. Uh, but they are seeing orders now coming in more plants, more plants needed in, let's say, Kalimantan and so forth. So this will also be another area of growth. Although the blending may not increase so much from B35 to B40. Uh, the third thing is a further in downstream integration. Like we mentioned, they will, uh, customers are not just using it for to refine palm oil, but also to move more downstream value-add products. Like, and, and that's maybe some easier to understand, like margarine or cocoa butter, some of those specialty fats. Yeah. Uh, the fourth reason why the order books have been strong is that now customers, so palm oil refineries are also spreading, not just in Indonesia and also Thailand. They're also spreading, especially in Latin America and uh, also in uh, Africa. So so that's the backdrop. Then the big one that could happen is the SAF bounty. So because, so SAF is sustainable aviation also. Um, most countries now have committed uh, from the jet fuel, that means those that is used in an aeroplane, they will actually blend it. For, uh, I think Singta, uh, SIA wants to blend by 1%. So th this will eventually move to 3 to 10% by 2030. Uh, in terms of the opportunity, it's, it's huge. I mean, the announced projects, this is announced whether it goes through because each SAF, pro each, uh, SAF refinery can cost as much as 800 US million because these are like almost petrochemical refinery that you see. So the plan ones is like almost 51 from the current 1.5. So, so there's a huge uh, jump in, in in demand. So most of this uh, SAF, which is you blend in with uh, with used cooking oil or you can blend in with this second point here, which is uh, palm oil affluent. So most of these palm oil plants, uh, they actually have a lot of affluent. That means uh, palm oil waste, waste oil. So what they plan to do is take this waste oil, convert it, into HBO uh, and then HBO hydrogenated. So it becomes, it replicates quite closely to, the biochemistry comes replicate very closely to petroleum like diesel. Uh, then which in turn will become the feedstock to produce SAF. Yeah, it's a bit uh, complicated. But I mean, the main thing is that there's a huge demand for SAF and that will be the big bounty for them if they can get the right contract. Uh, this is not part of the order book right now. Uh, then the other thing is the strength of the whole model. So they are very asset light. So, um, uh, their ROE is 31 million. I think their fixed assets is probably 1 or 2 million ringgit. But uh, because the, uh, this is even though they have 132 million ringgit net cash. Uh, so why they win projects is because they have a 45 year track record. Uh, and also they have a proprietary process technology. Uh, uh, and the RO, high ROE is mainly because uh, they don't have much assets. So they will actually subcontract all the work, like fabrication of heaters, boilers, pipes, and so forth. They will subcontract it. Uh. So they'll get the contract, they will send the equipment over, and then they will project management, project manage and make sure the thing is commissioned well and so forth. Uh, the, they're paying historical dividend yield of 5%. So in terms of the target, <clears throat> So we're valuing it at 15 times PE. The, there's no real direct comparable. So the peers are trading at 24 times. Uh, on a forward-looking basis, this stock is trading on, uh, I mean, historical price is about uh, EV EBITDA of one time. That means uh, one time cash flow because their balance sheet is uh, almost all cash. So 70% of the of the share price, uh, uh, or maybe 60% now, I guess, is about, it's in cash. Yeah. Uh, next slide. So this is the order book. Uh, the last two columns, 4951, that's our own forecast. So from 70 to 361, that's where they get the 50% growth. Uh, then this is just a big industry uh, chart on the right. It's just to show that the backdrop for palm oil is, is healthy. I mean, you're still going to get like 3%, at least over the past 10 years, about 3% growth per annum. That's production. And this will support the demand for more refineries and so forth. So, so they are not in the pro, uh, just to re remind uh, they're not in the palm oil, they're not they don't um sorry, they don't palm the they don't plant all these palm oil trees and so forth. What they do is after uh, everyone harvests the FFB or the fruits, then you need to crush it and then need to refine it into uh refined crude oil. Yeah. So they do the plants for them. Uh, next slide. Then uh, uh this is just a, a um a table of 
their competitors, uh, I mean their peers or the supply chain proxy, there isn't an exact replica. I think any competitor they have, they're all private. So what we did was we just took a proxy. So the closest is actually this new IPO called uh, Carbon Re-Energy, which is essentially their equipment supplier. So this company, Carbon Re-Energy, just listed, I think, uh, one or two weeks ago. They actually provide the equipment to Alltech, uh, the which Alltech will then deliver to customer premises for installation and uh, commissioning. But lack of better comparable, this is the best we can come off with. So that's why we traded, at a, put it at a bit of a discount to their peers. Uh, next slide. So I'll go on to the usual Singapore Weekly. So in terms of the uh, macro news, the main one was the visitor arrivals into Singapore. Uh, it's still growing at 15%. The pace, of course, cannot be sustained the 20-30% that we had the last few months, but it's the slower since the reopening. But what we think is that right now, the annualized arrivals about 15 million. It probably hit, hopefully hit 19. Then after that, it might go back to the pre-pandemic, you know, 3 to 4% kind of pace. Uh, growth, the one that ASEAN visitors, the one that came down, but uh, visitor arrivals from China continue to be robust. So it's like up two and a half times year on year. Uh, still, the momentum is still continuing from last month, I'm 143%. Uh, there was also the PMI new order. So this is the uh, factory survey of uh, purchasing manifest. So just to gauge manufacturing activity in, in Singapore. Uh, the momentum, momentum is still healthy, it's still expanding. Uh, electronics especially uh, is the highest in 32 months. Of course, it's very gradual. Right? You talk about 50.9, 51, but again, it's still uh, the highest read. Uh, we also got data on Singapore FX Reserve, which continues to rise. So year to date, May, we are up about 19 billion. So probably for the whole year, we probably could be up uh, 40, 50 billion in flows. Uh, it's Of course, you notice it's lower than last year, but uh, what we don't have is the MES. So MES actually transfers year to date. The last two years, they transferred from our FX reserve to GIC, probably about 180 billion US or roughly. Uh, I don't have the March 24, so we're not sure how much they transfer, uh, how much more they transfer. So the actually, so the inflows could be even more than this 20 bi 19 billion that you see because we don't have the, the clarity on that. Uh, there were some export numbers from Taiwan. We always monitor Taiwan and Korea just to get a sense of the export market. Uh, a bit soft, I mean, it's not like very strong. It's, it's definitely recovering because it's recovering from negative 14% last, uh, last month, but it's not a very robust recovery. Uh, uh, all over, for the US, we have all over, we had the headline news, you know, the, all the payrolls which beat the forecast. Uh, we'll talk about it later. Uh, but manufacturing activity is also in the US a bit mixed. So what we do sense is that the more and more data points from the US is slowing down in general. Uh, next slide. Uh, so in terms of our usual tactical views, uh, what we see is that the market is, because of the strong payrolls number, actually the bond yields went up about 13 basis points in on Friday itself. Uh, and then what's happening is that uh, the uh, most of the payrolls, we don't think is a reflection of the strong economy in the US because most of the jobs coming in, uh, the job additions, all government related. So it's government, it could be healthcare, it could be social care. So I don't think that's a reflection of a strong economy, but... Um, the market is pushing the first rate cut from July uh, to September, November. Uh, the other big news was the ECB cut rates. So this is going to be uh, useful for all the European rates. Uh, the first in five years. Uh, they're not very clear direction when what they're going to cut, but the, there's a 50% probability the next cut will be in September. So they didn't give any strong signals, that, you know, the usual data dependent. Uh, uh, in terms of this week, they're going to have a very event-packed week so we, of course, apart from the NVIDIA 10 for one speed on Monday, then Wednesday is an important day too. We're going to have the CPI inflation. Uh, we think it's going to meet, uh, expect to meet expectations. I'm not sure that's the right word to use, but uh, we don't. We think trend line-wise, we think inflation only going to pick up probably June, July, and probably not, not this month. Uh, and then the big uh, Wednesday, there's also the FOMC meeting. So everyone will be focused on the dot plots. So if you recall the dot pots in March, they're looking at probably three rate cuts. You're probably going to see this revised up to maybe two rate cuts or even one rate cut. The other thing to watch is also Apple. They're going to have their worldwide developer concern, uh, conference. So this one, uh, everyone is just going to watch whether they're going to announce anything. They, uh, they, because uh, Tim Cook mentioned there's some big plans for AI. But so we're going to see what this so-called big plan is. Uh, the closest stock in Singapore that is relying on Apple is probably going to be nano flame because they are 
I think Apple is their biggest customer. Uh, then the on Friday you're gonna have Bank of Japan. You know, uh, again, the comment, the focus will be whether what they're gonna comment on because their currency like thirty four year low. Yeah. Okay. Uh. Then the next part, the events is just for your uh, reference. The green ones are probably the more important ones, just for your reference. Yeah. Uh, then this week we're also gonna have quite a bit of uh events. This is open for anyone or anyone can register. Just go to the poems website. Uh, we have iread. So you want to know like uh like highlighted last week, you know, if the ECB cut rates, how does this benefit them? Then we have Singtel. Uh, we have a buy call. I mean, you can just read a report and then you can ask them questions. Uh, then you got Uni Asia. If you want to find out more about dry bulk shipping, uh, then of uh the the other big one is of course OCBC. Uh, OCBC will not be presenting about the bank. They'll be presenting about the uh, general offer for Great Eastern. So you can actually ask them that. And then if you're interested, uh, you can also join in for our all tech presentation. That's probably on the twenty one of June, uh, next night. Uh, these are all just charts on what we just mentioned. So for Singapore arrivals, you'll notice this blue line here. Uh, uh, so we were growing about 5% KGA. So we picked about 19 million visitors in January 2020, just before COVID. So we the blue line shows that it's trending back up. Uh, so this gives uh, some hit, uh, tailwind that you know, the arrivals should still be strong in, in Singapore. Just that once we hit 19, then we might try to trend down much slower. Uh, the the one on the bottom here is just which from which country. Uh, so China is bound, bouncing back very sharply. Yeah. Surprisingly, ASEAN and is also doing well. Uh, the one is just on the right. Just to, you can see the recovery in the electronic sector in and the manufacturing activity, which I think is no surprise to everyone. The manufacturing is recovering. Uh, just the pace. Uh, yeah, we, we are not so aggressive on the pace, but it's definitely recovering. Uh, next slide. Then here is just the FX reserve. The blue line shows the FX reserve. You'll notice that. Pre-pandemic, we were about two eighty-three billion. Right now, we are probably hitting about three eighty billion. Uh, you notice this big collapse. It was mainly because a lot of it, uh, that one hundred and seventy-six billion you see on the title, it went to the GIC. It was transferred out. It was not because there was a lot of outflow. There were some outflows, of course, but a lot of it was due to uh, I think the reserve sent sent over. Uh, next slide. Then this is just one last slide for me just to show the, no, just the illustration of that the the recovery has happened. So I'm not sure whether the exports can, can recover even more. But there's some weak data coming out in the US and and any more, if it slides even more, then you, the, the, no, there's so-called risk of recession. But you can see it, it can, it has, it has some coincidence uh, with uh, recession time, which is shaded. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, oh yeah, this is just to show you the jobs. So 60% of the jobs, the highest since global financial crisis, has come from the US. So, so why this is important, just to sh show that although we got really strong payrolls, uh, it's not really sh reflective that the economy is strong. Uh, the red line is the economic sensitive jobs, which is actually sliding down. And the blue line is the you know, it's government, healthcare. So again, the economy is very heavily, uh, heavily reliant on government spending in the US. Okay, I think this should be done. I think I can move on to Q&A. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, I think I'll take a couple of questions. There are a few questions here on Senecon. Um, okay, I think the easy one here first. Uh, for high bandwidth memory, only SK Hynix has it today. Um, so actually, no, most of the memory guys have it. Um, so in the chat, or rather than the table just now, uh, Micron, SK Hynix, and Samsung. Uh, actually, Intel also has high bandwidth than me. They have, a, um, I guess, a, a memory section in their business, although it's still not that big. But uh, yeah, most of the, the memory guys have already have high bandwidth. Yeah, I hope that helps. Uh, the other question is, can you elaborate more on AI PCs? Uh, for example, it's features that are different from current. Is it, is it just a quick marketing hype? Uh, so yes and no. The the difference between AI PCs and you know what your PCs have right now is uh, the AI PCs generally generally will have uh, like every other PC refresh cycle, they have better um performance, you know, better chips inside, uh, more efficient, more memory, blah blah blah. Uh, the other the AI portion to it is that uh these PCs will specifically have more uh, AI components to it or AI related components to it. So if you talk about which, which essentially are, would most likely be more your GPUs or your TPUs, which are your, your tensor core processors. So some of these chips that can do, um, uh, I guess more, more matrix 
uh, computations rather than just linear or, or sequential computations because the whole uh, idea of AI is, is um, you know, machine learning and, and, and generative, right? So, so in order for your AI PC to, to enable these functions, they'll need the components within it. Uh, and some of these components will be your better GPUs and CPUs, QPUs, and so all the whatever you use in there. Uh, yeah, so the, those, that's the, the real uh, main difference from a hardware standpoint. Uh, so a bit of it is, is uh, I guess in summary, a bit of it is you know, better performance, but a bit of it is also uh, newer components that enable um, this sort of AI revolution to happen. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so it is a little bit of hype, but there, there is some merit to, to uh, AI PCs. Um, yeah, I think that's all. For me, yeah, I'll hand it back to the rest of my colleagues uh, to answer the rest. Thank you. Hey, thanks, John. Um, I'll take this one about the DBS firstly. I think there's one question for me, so it's quite a long question. Let me read it out. Uh, hi, Miss. Hi, Glenn. May I know what is the historical average PB of DBS? It seems like its current PB is quite a bit higher than the historical. Uh, do you think that a correction may be coming soon to bring its PB closer to the historical? Yeah, uh, good question. So I will think that um, no majority of, uh, sorry, no, what am I talking about? The historical average of uh, PB of DBS, yeah, you're right. It's, it's currently the 10-year average is at 1.76 times. And this is higher than, uh, sorry, the current average is 1.76 times. Well, compared to its historical 10-year average, it's only 1.28 times. So it's around uh, 30 plus percent higher. Um, but do you think that, so your other question is, do you think that a correction may be coming soon to bring its PB closer? I think the reason why uh, its PB is so high is because due, mainly due to uh, its growth uh, in the recent years, we have seen uh, double-digit growth in its earnings and also their dividend yield and their ROE. So ROE also has been increasing uh, rather well and the dividend yield has also been increasing every year on year, especially when you compare them to the other to their peers, they are being able to give back a lot more dividends, you know, and return their capital, excess capital back to their shareholders. And also they are not really uh, capping themselves when you look at the dividend payout ratio you know, of like 50% or even maybe 60%, right? So they're just looking at the net amount and saying that we're going to increase it by uh, however much. They said in the, during the investor day last year was that 24 cents a year. So they gave that and they're keeping to it. So every quarter, they're actually keeping to this 24 cents. So we do feel that they might be able to even increase further this 24 cents. And we have seen that also last year where they pushed it up earlier than expected. And they also gave that uh, one for 10 bonus share issue. So that came as a surprise as well where they gave back more to their shareholders. So that was probably one of the reasons why their current uh, PB ratio is quite high. And also, you know, will it have, will it correct? It's also depending on whether they can keep up to this dividend yield uh, payout ratio and whether or not they can keep to their to what they are actually promising the, the shareholders are by returning capital. So recently we we did uh, listen into their we did uh, you know, ask a few questions. They did ask a few questions regarding this um sort of dividend payout, whether is it going to increase, right? And you know, the it was very vague. There was no yes or no. So that's a good sign because it means that there's a possibility that we could see further increase in their dividend yield, which could actually maintain their, their PB ratio because the expectation is for dividends to continue growing. And you know, there are also other factors that can make them, uh, they are able to actually maintain their, their high dividend payouts. And that is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that their net interest margins will probably be, be quite stable, but you know, loans growth will, will buffer that. So the net interest income will continue to grow and also fee income will, will actually provide a good, growth driver for, for their earnings, which could uh, further support the, the higher dividend payouts going into the future. So I hope that is uh, enough. Uh, sorry. Um, so majority of banks fee income comes from credit card fees, right? Uh, actually, so I don't know, no, it's not true. So I would say majority, a bulk of their fee income actually comes from their wealth management fees. So uh, card fees and you make up quite a small component. I think it's only like 10 to 20% uh, on average for the banks for their fee income. So a lot of it comes from their wealth management fee income. So that's why I put up this slide earlier and I gave a short segment of how 
uh, fee income, wealth management fee income, as well as their AUM growth is actually quite important to the bank's overall fee income. So there's a second one where saying there's a report. The second part of this question says, there is a report saying that more and more people are using e-wallet for payment nowadays compared to credit card. Will this affect the bank's fee income in longer term? I don't think so that more people are, I, I'm not sure uh, where's this report, maybe it'll be a good, uh, I'll go and read it up on this. Um, but then again, if you look at the e-wallet, right, there's other ways you can see the e-wallet as well. So people can link up uh, e-wallets to credit cards and the bank still can earn, you know, their card fee income from this as well. So if you look at e-wallet, it has to be for the banks to lose their, their share in credit card, you know, it's where they actually deposit money into like maybe say a grab pay wallet. Right, and then they use that you no know, the cash to to spend instead of linking up a credit card. So, I don't think the banks are actually going to lose out on market share from their credit card fees. So even then, you know, all the banks also have their own e wallet, right? Like uh, Payla, for example, by DBS, and a lot of people are using the Payla e wallet. So that's also one way that the banks can sort of maybe if they see the trend moving from credit cards, they can also create their own app. And I think the banks are doing that quite well. Yep. So I don't think, no, I don't think this will affect the bank's fee income in the longer term. Yep. They're still growing quite strongly. I think the biggest um, sort of uh, factor that will affect them would be the other, their competitors that their peers where, you know, they give maybe better promotions or better cashbacks. And then that's how they can lose their credit card fee income uh, market share. Uh, can you comment on Great Eastern and what is the likely scenario playing out? Uh, I'm not really sure what you meant by likely scenario, but yeah. So for Great Eastern wise, I think what's happening now, at least this is just uh, really my, my opinion, is that the share price has been, the current share price is actually a bit higher than what their offer price is. So um, uh, are you asking this from, sorry, can I clarify if you're asking this from a shareholder's perspective of GE or OCBC? By the way, maybe I'll just... Uh, Elaborate on both. So as an OCBC shareholder, you'll probably be wondering why uh, OCBC is you know, suddenly wanting to buy out the rest of Great Eastern. You know, they already currently own around 89%. So the small percentage left is actually not very significant, right? Because they're still earning from Great Eastern. So I think the main thing is that they, are, they will have better synergy with Great Eastern and they will be able to uh, have full control, basically, of, of Great Eastern. And this would be able to bring make them maybe expand out more and do dif different things like with Great Eastern as compared to previously when they only have like 89%. So this will hopefully increase their, their earnings for, for Great Eastern as well. And okay, so secondly, you're, you're saying about the shareholders of Great Eastern, right? So the likely scenario playing out is that they, if the share price is man maintained at this level, right, there could be a possibility because during the call, they did not say that this is the final offer. Right, so if the share price is able to maintain above their offer price, then we could see them give a, a second offer where they actually increase the, the offer price. Yeah, but currently they haven't said anything yet and we haven't heard any news. So it would be a, a good chance to you know, for you to actually attend that, 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 uh, that OCBC talk that we have on Friday, where you know, I think the, they will be presenting on, on the Great Eastern offer and you could also ask them uh, questions on this. Yeah, ho hope that is a good uh, uh, enough explanation. Yeah, if anything, uh, please do ask them on Friday and join our join the webinar. It'll be quite uh, insightful. Yeah, thanks. So I'll hand it over to Paul for the rest. Thanks. Thank you, Glenn. So, uh, thank you. So uh, there's one question for me. Uh, your comments on Adobe growth prospects and threats, is that a buy or sell? So uh, uh, basically Adobe, uh, like it's expected to report its earnings uh, end of this week. So uh, we expect a growth rate for the current quarter of about 9% uh, growth rate. And it's uh, it, the revenue growth rate, it has been uh, falling over the last few quarters. So this is mainly because first of the reasons the management said that uh, we believe that it's uh, uh, the, the there's a slowdown. It's mainly because the price increases which have been happened maybe a two or three years back, it has uh, already hit its customer base and it's as it is now starting to roll off. And uh, second reason is that like uh, 
the it has although it has integrated uh, AI across its products. Uh, for example, its Fearfly AI tool, which has been integrated into Photoshop, and uh, the users they can generate images from text-based prompts. But it's still not uh, contributing to its top line growth. And this the the these core features it is already uh, facing competition uh, competition from other players like Mid to Journey and Open AI's Dali. So even these uh, uh, other players, they are also uh, 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 providing these uh, services. And as a result, because of competition, uh, 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 it's uh, facing competition. And also in terms of like uh, top line uh, growth contribution from these features, we don't expect it to significantly contribute at least for this year. And uh, we also uh, 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 need to wait that uh, the, the, these features, the management, the company is already providing like uh, uh, free of cost. It's providing like uh, a free credits right now for its users to use these services. But uh, we need to wait like how much uh, the company is able to convert these free users to paid users. And uh, as a result, uh, 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 in the near term, we don't expect any contribution from the AI tailwinds right now for Adobe. And uh, overall, in terms of uh, uh, target price, we have a reduced recommendation and a target price of about $465. And uh, this is mainly because like, uh, uh, we, we, the revenue growth for Adobe, it has been uh, remained constant over the last uh, two years or so. It's, it, it's grew by about 11%. And uh, this year also, we expect the revenue growth rate to grow by about a 10% or so for the fiscal year of 2024. And uh, uh, since the revenue growth rate has been uh, stable, I mean, there is no significant contribution. We, uh, we have a reduced recommendation for Adobe. So hope that helps. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, um, yeah, this one is 17. Let me see. No, no. Yeah, okay, uh, Keppel Corp share price has been trending southwards. What's your take? Yeah, I think, okay, the, the only news announcement that came up was the that the authorities plan to tend to award two more power plants. Uh, I think that, 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 to me, at least, is a negative. Uh, 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 I mean, this is a very technical term, but I hope the, the, I hope the EMA don't become a uh, Kiasu uh, again, and then then you have this overcapacity of power plants again. Uh, so, so that's our worry. But again, these are like probably three to four years away. Th that was the, probably the only news that that came up from my recollection. Uh, in the near term, we we still think that uh we still have a buy mainly because we think the uh capital cop at least for the next twelve months will still undergo some of these divestments. So the the two big one will be of course if they can. Uh, they still have, I think, another twelve billion of assets they want to sell. Plus, they will sell their rig, rig assets, which they can collect back almost four billion, uh, which is on on the book about four billion. So, the I think operationally it's going to be stable. So, so it's more about them being able to monetize some of the assets, which we still think that they can because I think the the rig market and so forth is picking up. Uh, the the cycle is picking up. So, especially like AHD as other. Well, uh, the the rig rates or the or the rental rates are all rising, so this is we think there's an opportune time for them to kind of dispose some of these assets. But longer term, we again worry that you no, know, maybe the the demand supply conditions for electricity or power in Singapore might change, you know? especially if we've got more capacity coming up. Um. Okay. There there are a few stocks here which I will I will leave Miao to answer some. Uh, any update? On sync post after Baba reduced his stake, who was the buyer? We're not clear who who's the actual buyer, but we don't have coverage. But we still think that it's kind of positive uh, over sync post because like they it, still going to be a government restructuring. So I think the best time to maybe sell the stock if you have is maybe after the government restructuring, which we think. Uh, sorry, keep repeating this. We should we should only benefit sync post. I mean, yeah. From the current, uh, they used to be loss making on the post and parcel. So we think any restructuring will be beneficial, because it's a bit unfair for them to to provide a public utility, and and have to subsidize the uh, I guess uh, the public. Uh. So I think if they push this uh, delivery of posts into more private sector that driven, then I think you can see the profits. And uh. then the, the next driver to the share price will be if they were to dispose of. 
the Singapore Center, which is of course it's forty percent of the earnings, but it's also like almost one billion worth, uh, almost the whole market cap. So these are the drivers. Again, it's all event driven rather than than operational because we, uh, we worry Singapore's the Australia logistics. Uh, I think it's starting to decline quite strong, uh, uh quite materially. Uh, so we're a bit more worried about that. Yeah. Hope that helps. Uh, yeah. Any views on Dynamic? I don't have any strong view, but I'm just using the uh, SBM offshore because if you if you have a stake in Dynamic, then the one to watch is SBM offshore because SBM offshore is the big apart from Petrobras, uh, the big uh rig op uh rig uh big FPSO operator. So. Dynamic is very he heavily reliant on FPSO construction. Uh, for those who don't know, so FPSO is uh, no one is uh, floating production storage. So if you, you know, most of the oil fields these days are in deep water offshore. So you uh, you need all these vessels uh, rather than a, uh, that it is like it looks like a container ship or oil tanker. Then from there you will uh, you will extract the oil from the ground, clean it, refine it. It's virtually like a refinery. Then you, you send it over to those tankers that will just sail next to it and deliver. Uh, based on SBM offshore, again, uh, not for me, uh, uh, but SBM offshore things that they are looking at probably 10 to 11 FPSOs to be awarded the next per year, the next three years. So if they are right, then there is a up cycle still at least up to 2026. So probably there's another 12 months of of, of orders. Just that I think Dynamax is running uh, too much capacity. So I think they just acquisition acquired a piece of land uh, to expand. So I think it, they are still fine. Uh, but the, uh, probably another 12 months or 18 months in the cycle still left until probably 2025 or mid-2025. Then maybe the market will get a bit more wary. Yeah. But it, it's useful to watch SBM offshore share price because they are ultimately the customer for C-Trim and even for Dynamax. Yeah. Uh, what Hong Kong exchange stock would you recommend as undervalued? So, yeah, so so sorry, we, we don't cover, we need to cover Singapore and and US stocks. So we don't really have any recommendation on Hong Kong. We probably have to uh, get it from our Hong Kong research. And if you go to our website, the poems, he actually has been conducting some uh, events looking at stocks with uh, with uh, deep value, uh, so-called uh, like uh, deep value stocks or value-driven stocks. So I think... I'm not sure if he's still holding those those events. Uh, yeah, but that's something that he does. Uh, or you can go to our Philip Capital YouTube and some of the recordings might be there. Uh, hi, Paul, for your presentation, all tech looks attractive to invest in. Could you share with us the potential risk? Um, the risk is like all companies would be the execution risk because the, like I said, order book grow 50%. So you're always going to face uh, the ability to execute. Uh, the only comfort the comfort we have is that they're very asset like so they will never run out of capacity i mean like you know, it's open i just have to the 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 good things don't have to just that you need a bit more pre project management people and technical people to manage since your order books are so full the other thing is uh their their main main shareholder is co brother so co brothers own 70% Again, we, we are not sure. I mean, they, uh, they can they can own 51% and still control the company. There's, sometimes there's no real need for 70%. So we're not sure of their intentions. Uh, even if they sell, I don't think they're just going to dump it in the market. So probably going to do some stick sale. So this, I guess, will be the will be the, will be the risk. And the other risk, I wouldn't say risk, if they do secure a big project on the, on the HVO, uh, 130 million ringgit is a lot of money, but I'm not sure maybe if they want to put in equity, they might need to raise money. There's a good and bad to it uh, because then they'll build recurrent income. Uh, and it also means that this is a really big project uh, because they are also going to make money from the profit. They can also take the profit and invest in the equity. Again, I'm not sure. I'm just speculating here. So if I were to come, kind of think of the, the, the risk out there. I hope that helps uh, Mr. Ang. Yeah. Uh, Cap... Well, uh, uh, some kind of industry seem to have more connect correction in the share price recently. Any update on the counter? I'm not really sure actually. I'm meeting them soon. Let me try and get uh, they, they're probably asking me too, but I have no idea what is causing the sell down. Uh, but but do know that that in the previous uh, in the previous call that they did mention in February or March, there'll be some downtime in there or unscheduled maintenance if I'm right. Uh, for their power plants. So, 
uh, they I don't think you should expect very strong growth in their first half. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's the only update I have uh, until I can't see them. Yeah. Uh any update on your view on IX Biopharma? So IX Bama Pharma, they they are virtually pivoting from my understanding, they're pivoting their whole portfolio. Uh initially they had this big win because they sold their license to a Nasdaq company. But then the last two years, you know, the whole bio uh pharma industry came down. Unless you're selling uh, uh and and Zepic, I mean, sorry, uh, what's the right word? Uh, the GLP three drugs. Uh, then because of that, they took back the license. Now they're looking for a new licensee. Uh, so that that's the the late, latest for them. Yeah. So I think it it has been uh yeah, and then they they're gonna dial them back uh, probably another one or two years, uh, because that big drug was supposed to generate licensing revenue for them, uh, but the 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 company, uh couldn't raise much more money because the whole Nasdaq collapsed. So then they, they didn't develop their drugs as scheduled. So I Bio Pharma pulled that back. Um, okay, ESR, I think I'm going to... Uh, SGX published flow on a weekly basis. At times, the STI is rising during the week. But the only market makers is the net buyer institution retail inflow are both negative. I, I For me personally, I don't really look much into the... Uh, outflow of, uh, because it's more coincident so uh, and sometimes you don't need to look at out fund flow you, you just look at the index you know there's fund inflow so I don't really look at it because it's quite intuitive uh, uh, like market is probably flat so maybe not much inflow market is up then I guess there's inflow so this I don't really look much into it I would uh, f yeah for me it's, uh, if I were to do it I would do the cumulative outflow then it will probably be a better signal. That means there's a lot of selling already done and it's exhausting. So probably that will how I'll use it. But I won't use it to try and predict predict that one because it's kind of obvious. Uh, there's inflow and then the market's up. But you're right. Uh, I mean, the the yeah, the institution net by institution probably makes up about 40% of the market, uh, roughly. I think, yeah. Your take on China Aviation and Costco shipping. Uh, I don't have much on Costco shipping, uh, but for China Aviation, we, we still like it. Uh, I think... The the growth is very obvious. I mean, China outbound. You can look at our own tourist number. The out the traffic is up. So they are they are like probably 70, 80 percent of the of the earnings is dependent on the Shanghai Putong Airport tourist outflow. Uh, I don't have the latest update. The uh for at least the whole China of outbound traffic. But if you look at the just the, the the number of tourists coming to Singapore, I mean, it's probably a good reflection of the amount of outbound tourists coming out of China. So for us, we're we're still positive on China Aviation. Just that they only release results every six months, so there won't be any update. So I think our forecast is still like 30, 40 percent earnings growth. Yeah. Okay, I I will hand it to the to the rest first uh, before I take on the rest. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Paul. Yeah. Uh I'll take on this one about UOB first. Uh I think that's yeah, that's the last remaining one for me. For now, uh, so Lillian asks, can you comment about UOB is future prospect valuation now, and is it the right time to buy now? Yep. So for UOB is future pros prospects, I would say that uh, we do expect UOB's profits to grow around eight percent, uh, year on year in twenty twenty four, and this will be on the back of stable margins, own growth recovery, as well as stronger fees and stable provisions. So we expect credit costs, uh, their provisioning to come in around their guidance of twenty five basis points. The, they have also guided for loans growth of low single digits, so we will see that coming in uh, at around that region, that range, uh, as there was, uh, we do expect you know, a slowdown in the first few quarters of the of this year. So second quarter, we also expect you know it might not be as, as, as good, but with the recovery expected more in the second half of the year. Um, and for net interest margins, it will hold above, uh, we're expecting it to hold above 2% for the rest of the year. So there's a possibility that it might increase slightly in uh, this quarter, so the second quarter results, and this would be mainly from the higher or longer interest rates as well as expectations for rate cuts to be uh, now smaller and slower than previously expected. Um, also for the credit cost to income ratio, so the expenses will remain stable at around 41 to 42% mainly due to the one-time costs from the Citigroup acquisition to roll off substantially in the rest of the year. And also for them to actually manage their, their, their costs. And we do expect them to sort of manage their, their expenses, their OPEX growth, 
So they'll probably be not be uh, hiring as aggressively as they did in their previous two years when you know uh, net interest margins and net interest income was at, at record high levels. So for fee income, as I've mentioned earlier, it's quite similar uh, across for the three banks where they are seeing actually a good growth in their wealth management and uh, fund management fees you know, as the market sentiment recovers and people are uh, having a more risk-on sentiment where they put in more money back into, into the wealth products and investment products compared to just throwing it into fixed deposits for their current account. So for UOB, their wealth management AUM in the first quarter did grow quite well. It grew 11, grew 11% year on year. And they have also managed to successfully integrate their CT portfolios in the Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand. So Vietnam will likely be completed very soon, uh, hopefully by the second quarter or third quarter of the year. And uh, this will help them to further expand their regional franchise and they can further grow their, their wealth management and uh, fund management income. So we are looking at around a double-digit fee income growth for FI24, which could add around $220 million to the to their revenue. So for their valuation now, we do have a we do maintain a buy call with an unchanged target price of $34.90. And um I think there's there's there will be another year of growth for UOB, mainly from uh, as what I mentioned earlier. And also they did uh mention something like along the lines where their dividend payout ratio, they are so they're the most strict where they say the dividend payout ratio will be maintained at 50% uh, uh, for this year, right? But if you look at their earnings growth where we are expecting around 8% increase, then I think base dividend and dividend yield will actually continue to grow into in for FY24. So that's a that's a good uh, for UOB. Yeah. So that's all I have for UOB. I'll hand it over to the rest of my colleagues. Thanks. Thank you, Glenn. I'll take the one seven life uh, question. So for one seven life, uh, they had uh, three initiatives this year. One is cost cutting. The other one is grow revenue for Way Library and also grow its MAU. Yeah. So just to refresh your memory about the Way Library. So instead of the normal uh, real person doing the live streaming, Way Library is the animated, yeah, the cartoon figure. So they will be doing the, um, the streaming instead. But behind the cartoon is still the real person. Yeah, and um, they mentioned they added uh, 3,000 new skin for Way Library. Yeah, so uh, this will attract the new streamers. As like originally, one skin used to cost uh, around like 2.5 thousand US dollars. Yeah, now it's like uh, free and readily available for them to try on the skin. Uh, yeah, so this will uh, grow the new streamers and lead to MAU growth. And also uh, they mentioned uh, they are, uh, they are, their cost cutting is well on track. Yeah, but never they have never mentioned like how much uh they has been cut. Uh they they have a target of 15 million uh, of cost cutting in FY24. Yeah, they mentioned the uh all the cost cutting cost part cutting part has already been done. So mainly will be through cutting down R and D expense and also uh decreased revenue sharing uh for the for the streamers. Yeah, so uh it's just the three initiatives that all will on track. And their business update is next month, already next month. Yeah, so we'll update accordingly. And there's a question in the chat. Singapore's rate looks under pressure despite high yield. How do you see risk in the next uh, three to six months? Yeah, well, our um, outlook for risk doesn't really change. We'll remain muted. Uh, yeah, so the catalyst for the risk to grow there, like the capital appreciation uh, will remain muted. And um, yeah, so uh, uh, because like, our hospital for the rate cut uh, is one rate cut by the end of this year. And um, like a majority of the rates, they hash their borrowing um, fixed cost of debt by around like 50%. Yeah, so they should have like already done their refinancing uh, way earlier than December if, if they do have a that to be refinanced. Yeah, so the turning point for the risk market in general should be probably next year uh, when the rally is an uh, aggressive uh, rate cut. Yeah, but now it's still a good time to accumulate rates uh, because like historically, uh, it's just uh, when Fed start to cut the rate, the share price uh, for the rate will also start to clash. Yeah, so uh, we believe now is a good time to accumulate. Yeah, that's all from me. I'll hand to Paul, maybe. Thank you. 
Yeah, I, I think for, for REITs in general, we, 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 we probably turning a bit more positive because most of the headwinds, uh, because the DPU couldn't grow because all their interest rates keep on climbing, you know, that the, some of the interest expense can come out like 20, 30 percent uh, or more, uh, not so much, I mean, probably around 20 percent. So we think most of these headwind in interest rates probably going to end by this year or if not, uh, first half of next year because most of them hedge out the three years and then the hedges are start to unwind. Uh, so, so, so I mean, if I were, if you were to do the next re report, it's probably called seize the yield, but provided it's is accurate. So, so why we say that is that if you look at the Singapore stock market, uh, probably annualized return is probably I don't know four percent or five percent with dividends. So if you can find something Singapore assets dividend yield with, uh, I don't know seven eight percent yield, you probably can replicate the market with 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 less risk, I guess. Uh, or we can move rep replicate it with a bond, uh, yeah, with a government bond, four five percent, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, let me just let's continue. Um, there were some views on Citrum capital infrastructure. For 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 Citrum, it, it, uh, it's going to be similar to Dynamic. Uh, the FPSO upcycle, uh, like we mentioned earlier, is still going to run. I think. Uh, I think Petrobras has that issue two or three. There's rumor to be another seven more. So. Uh, the, there is still going to be a huge pipeline of opportunities. Uh, I don't think Citrum is going to enjoy a lot of profitability because of all their write-offs and so forth. But news flow-wise, I think it, the, the news flow for Citrum, we think is still going to be positive. For Prime US Read, uh, I think they are they need to do their refi of their uh, of their bank loan by this month. So uh, they still seem confident of doing. I'm not sure what's the latest update, uh, but. They have to do it by by this month. I'm just looking at the at the at the announcement. Yeah, and the latest divestment was a was positive news because they, they managed to deliver. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if they were to, oh, if we had to, I mean, it's, again, it's limited visibility. But if they can pull off this refinancing, then it's not only them. I think the whole whole US REIT market. Uh, I mean, the whole all the the other two US REITs also could actually rally because it just shows that. Uh, there is refinancing opportunity. The difference for prime US REIT is that uh, most of their bankers are from the US. Most of the banks that finance them are US. Whereas for the other two REITs, these are all Singapore banks, which I think is you can argue that they are more risk averse uh, for two US assets. Uh, capital infrastructure, I really am not very sure. Not, not a big fan. Uh, because most of the dividends are paid up by borrowing money. Uh, so uh, not, not a big fan of that. I'd rather buy a REIT, which doesn't need to borrow money to pay dividends. Uh, for ESR Rogers, I'm really not sure. I, uh, Darren is on leave today. Uh, so so apologies. I probably got no, can't really answer that for you. Uh, the view on city death. So again, Darren's on leave, but our general view is that the property market still weak. Uh, because I cover prop next one, but I monitor a lot of the volume. So the volumes I think are still down like thirty over percent. Uh, like we repeated last week, unless you you have your Gokko land, they probably can sell out like eighty five, eighty percent in a weekend. Then. The rest could be tricky for them because especially CD Dev, they have one big uh, development in core central region. So developers with exposure to core central region, the you know the uh eight nine ten zone uh eight nine ten areas, the core, the most expensive areas, uh, that's a bit troubling because you don't you can't sell to foreigners. So, so that's a bigger worry. Uh, especially they are they launched they haven't really officially launched their Fuzi Xerox. If I'm not mistaken, so although no, this store is of course high value. Right? the uh, own RA Navy calculation is like seventeen dollars. If I'm not mistaken, so it's a huge discount. But again, this discount can stay for a while. So uh, until we get some better sentiment over property, I think it's going to be tough for city development. Uh, for Thai Beth, we uh, we still have a buy. Uh, no change in that. They are doing an AGM come and this briefing on Friday, so we try and update if there are any new new not new things. But uh, again, uh, like we said, for Thai Beth, it's just it's just cheap. I think it's trading like 12, 13 times PE for a consumer stock that has a has a, mon a virtual monopoly in Thailand for spirits. Uh, the big growth we think could surprise would be the beer division. Uh, what put them down in the results in the most recent results was was uh, the second half was mainly because of the property, uh, which is phases property. So these are all volatile, but it does hurt the, the headline news. But otherwise, we think uh, beer growth will come in uh, that could help the share price. Then second will be if the Thailand 
government again uh, probably talk about this the 10 time uh, uh, that they start to do some stimulus uh, because the Thai stock market is actually even worse than China which is quite an achievement so sentiment over Thai stocks not just Thai breath is generally weak right now our uh, capital infrastructure computer they are for Ventura bus does it mean they've been doing share placement or preferential offering I, 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 from what I understand, if I recall, they plan to do it, but I did with their share price like this. I'm not sure whether they can do it. So, uh, l l uh, because the share price I think dropped quite, quite significantly uh, recently. So, uh, again, we always be a bit wary, uh, for business trust because when they once they start to tap on borrowings to pay dividends, then you know that's not sustainable. Yeah, in the longer term, I mean, near term, they can do it. So, uh, this is our general view. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, capital infrastructure has not announced dividend for the quarter. I did not. Yeah, I think they do mini half yearly, if I'm not, not mistaken. Uh, so, uh, I just I don't really attend capital infrastructure uh, briefings, uh, but this is just for my general read up. So, it's, it's not the really good answers for you, but uh, hopefully, I think it can help. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, this is the person who asked about the seven song. Yeah, sorry, ESR logo, so that uh, they're not around, so I can't help you on that. Yeah. Uh, any update? I'm not sure what's DCRU. Uh, okay. Any update on Olam? Oh, um, okay. As you recall, there's st they are still pending the listing in Saudi Arabia. That will that will really bring the share price up if they can do it. Uh, I think they delayed it. The last call I was in the briefing uh, was second half of next year. Uh, my understanding is that they done well. I I uh, my guess is they yeah. But but anyway, <laughs> anyway, the results doing well is sometimes you no know, trading gains can also help no? Uh, but in the meantime, it's all about the IPO. So uh, there's no real update on it. I'm not sure how to gauge if there's an update. Maybe one way is to watch how the Saudi Arabia, uh, Saudi market is performing and any peers which are not really monitored. So that could be one way to gauge whether they are they can they are able to do a listing in Saudi Arabia because they're supposed to do a like a a, a Thai I mean a Saudi equivalent of a ADR. Uh, and if that happens, then well, I think this 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 thing can pop uh, because it's uh, uh, because the valuations there was pretty steep. Yeah. Okay, I, I think uh, yeah, hi Zin, uh, hi uh, hi Zin, have how come your TA and SN never take in transaction volume to? I think he does it, maybe in his. Uh, but I I let him answer when he's back because, uh, he's on leave today, so uh, he's not able to together with Darren. Yeah. So I probably can't answer that for him. Uh, hopefully when he comes back, but I will I will let him know. Then he can probably post it in P three community. Uh, do you think the new HDR reset portal will affect prop next? I don't really think so. I think the HDB, if I'm not mistaken, the new HDB reset portal will give a bit more transparency on the pricing. But but many people still use uh. They use real estate agents uh, because of the complication. You know, you, you still need to understand the grants the, uh, and so forth. Uh, you can also get price transparency in Property Guru. So I I, I think price transparency has never been the reason people hire, hire the real estate agents. It's mainly because the the it, it's mainly because you know of the need uh, it's so complicated with all the government grants these days and getting your loans and so forth I, I think you can still diy but many people still use the the real estate agents from the developer's point of view or, or they they were 100 percent going to use uh, real estate agents uh, having spoke to one of them one of the main reason is because of the tdsr uh now that the tdsr uh, uh sorry or the absd uh, sorry, not tdsr sorry the absd so if the developers don't sell within five years, they're going to be slapped with uh, huge penalties. So because of that, the developers are very anxious to sell. So they are even more reliant on uh, agents. Uh, but for HDB buyer, I still think they'll still use it. Uh, um, they might affect it uh, to a certain extent, but if it's just price transparency. Uh, so uh, that's my understanding of the resale portal. Uh, sorry if I probably got this wrong. Uh, do you think... Do you think the upcoming Olympics and Euro soccer will boost? Um, it it can boost a little bit. Yeah, I think from recollection, it can help a little bit. Uh, but it depends how the market react. The market might just think of it as a one off. But historically, since covering it, yeah, they do get a bit of a bump up. I think personally, uh, you also will drink more when you watch soccer. But uh, not to encourage it, but uh, but they do get a bump up. But whether the market really reprice their growth, but I guess it does help them because. 
uh, not only because people consume more, they actually will hold more activities, more beer activities in Thailand uh, when they have such uh, events. Uh, yeah, but but you are exactly right now. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, heard you spoke about Dynamax and FPSO, but missed the essence. Can you share? Yeah. Okay. So when I look at, at Dynamax, I normally look at SBM Offshore because SBM Offshore is one of the biggest uh FPSO operators, excluding the all companies are uh, like Petrobras. So they do give some clarity on where they see orders. So uh, of course they are a bit biased. I mean they're obviously going to point a more bullish outlook. But from their view, at least, uh, last year there were seven FP over FP FPSOs awarded. Uh, the twenty twenty four to twenty six they are looking at at least ten to eleven. So there's still growth. Uh, so my own view is that probably up to twenty twenty five you probably see the upcycle. Then twenty twenty six you got to be. Uh, a bit more caref careful again. This is just my own interpretation of their own guidance. Uh. So, uh, because FBSO, so, you know, is like the ultimate customer. They are the ones who, who are the operator and who the ones who order all these FBSOs. So, Dynamic Mini does the top side. That means all the like the all the the complication. You know, you look like a you look at the FBSO. You look at uh, all the the all the steel bars, the thing that 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 extracts the all virtually the brains of the whole FBSO. I mean, you like already. Because you actually dig, uh, suck in the oil, you have to clean it, refine it. So not refine it into diesel and all that, but just clean it and remove all the oil, the dirt and everything. Uh, the water, sorry, and the dirt. Okay. Uh, I hope that helps. Yeah, I, I hand it over to the rest. Uh, okay, uh, who's the replacement for Peggy? Uh, so Myanmar will be the one looking over the counters that she's doing. Uh, for Kepler and Semcorp and ST Engineering, I will be the one uh, covering it until we get the next the new analyst coming in soon. Okay. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Uh, hand over to the rest. Yeah. I think there's one. <coughs> excuse me. There's one on IFAS. So it's ask, asking any updates on IFAS. The price is stagnant and downward bias. Yeah. Uh, good question. Uh, for the updates on IFAS, I think the the main there's not much, not really many updates. Just that they are still working on. They are really working very hard. I would say on their global bank. So their banking business. They really see that as that is the growth driver for them going into the future. And um, if you look at their other lines of business, you look at their, the what, what is actually giving them the growth currently, it will be, a lot of it will be coming from the e-pension, the Hong Kong e-pension business, right? It contributed 24 million to their earnings in FY23. So, you know, going into this year, it's expected to add more than 43 million in FY24. So I feel that this is one of the growth drivers for them, uh, at least for these two years. Uh, so the contract ends in... Uh, uh, so it will be up till 2025 and then it will, it will sort of, uh, I think it will, they will refresh and then they have to bid for the contract again. So for the global bank, their IFAS global bank, which is in UK, is still loss making and you know, they're only expecting it to break even by the fourth quarter of this year. Uh, so after that, you know, it's really hard to say how much really con will it contribute to their, to their growth and their, their earnings. Now. Um, why, why is it uh, price is stagnant? I think it might be uh, profit-taking. So majority of the shareholders for IFAS, interestingly, it's around, I think 36% it's owned by the general public. So it's quite a large amount. So it might be due to uh, people are taking profit after the, the share price hit a sort of record level. And then, you know, uh, the, this individual shareholders are actually taking profits. So that might be one of the reasons. And also, um, a bit of worry maybe as to how much the Hong Kong e-pension business can support their business and if uh, if whether or not when or so will their banking business actually start to provide uh, uh, earnings uh, to their to their bottom line. Yeah, hope that is is sufficient. I'll hand it over to the rest of my colleagues. Thanks. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, so this is question or statement on on AI PCs, matrix completion is unlikely to be a application for personal PC unless there are many more games on the PC. Yeah, so you're, you're totally right. I mean, that's kind of why when I answered the previous question about whether it's a hype, kind of 50, 50 on it. Um, uh, but so, so right now, what, what a lot of these uh, well, yes, hardware or, or PC manufacturers are doing are they just loading up their PCs with you know, the best technology um, higher components that can take you know higher temperatures, uh, more memory space, uh, more efficient computing, 
uh, in anticipation for um, more complex uh, applications. So I think the, the thing is we probably won't see it on a personal PC side because you know when you're using a personal PC most of the functions that you're going to be using are very basic. Uh, I think we'll probably see it more on the enterprise side especially for a lot of uh, I guess more complex um, uh, uh, use cases or industries and new uh, biosciences uh, things that, that require a lot of com computing a lot of uh, 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 I guess predictive models uh, maybe, maybe like automotive things like that that, that will probably be more on where the use cases at least the early stages of use cases for AIPC go when it comes to just us using your know, normal PCs like you're just gaming just <laughs> A basic graphic, basic graphics card. Me, a, a slightly better graphics card, but you don't need to overhaul your PC, uh, to do that. Uh, yeah. So, so, hope that helps to kind of clarify the the statement. Uh, yeah. I think that's all for me. Uh. I'll maybe hand it back to the rest of my colleagues if they have any more answers. Then. Okay, let, let me try. Um, Miao, you have, um, Miao, do you have anything on digital core? Yeah. Uh, okay. Any update on Alishan? There's nothing new on on Alishan. Uh, the things to watch for would be the uh, the I think they locked in up eight hundred keys. Uh, they they still plan to grow Kolibu by eight hundred keys. They're co living. The thing that is uh coming up now is the MOH contract. They they need to execute on that or at least construct. Uh, complete that where they will supply to the to the nurses then the other one would be the uh, the other big I think 187 rooms I just stepped in my mind what, what's the name of the project but uh, th there's really not nothing new on on at the end from our last report huh? yeah it's just still going to be the 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 earnings it's still going to be driven by the Hollywood the first half their earnings triple to 9 million so uh, one of the key divisions of course it's not the whole thing yeah N nothing really new uh, so, uh. for Fortress Minimal I uh, I think it's weak probably because iron ore prices are, are coming down quite quite sharply uh, uh, because in view of what's happening in, in China yeah so uh, I uh, I didn't really attend their last briefing because I too, uh, so I don't really have a, a proper update for you on, on them any news is causing inching up downwards recently uh, not particularly clear. My only understanding for the digital core is that they, uh, some of the new they are still facing a bit of uh tenancy occupancy issue for for some of their data centers. Huh? Yeah, I think that that's the the main the, the main news event. Huh? Yeah. Uh, Darren will know this better. Sorry, but I just on leave today. Yeah. I guess DCRU is is data is the digital core. Yeah. But it's inching out a bit. I'm not yeah, I'm so, so sorry. Uh, some of this I'm not very familiar, so we, we can't circle some of our analysts are away. Okay, uh yeah, thanks everyone for the questions. Yeah, today we're gonna to keep it a bit short because Zane is not in. Uh, so so thanks everyone for your time. Uh hope it was useful for you. And I uh, hope to see you Nick. Uh the following two weeks because the coming Monday uh, is a public holiday, so we won't be having that. So hope to see you again and, and thanks everyone and hope everyone have a really good week ahead and a good holiday break on the following Monday. Thanks everybody. <laughs>